What's going on everybody? I'm Jay, the Reform Puerto Rican Dude. Thank you so much for watching this video. Today's topic, what can Christians do about widespread atheism and moral relativism? So it's it's funny that you guys actually voted for this. You know, normally I, I put this for those of you guys that are watching this video that don't know what I'm talking about. So I, I will post a poll on a Facebook Facebook group, excuse me, called Wastywack or Wastywack, which is an acronym for wait a second, this is wholesome, actually Christian content. So I'll put these polls up and people will vote on what uh, I should do or what topic I should cover for my next video. So um, there's two ways to vote. Basically, I will put a couple options of things that I'm thinking about doing or uh, people can add options and then they will vote on that. So this topic is actually something that people... That, that somebody suggested. It's not one topic that I came up with and put it out there. So it, it's just pretty interesting because I have people in my family and among friends and things like that who kind of fit, well, they don't kind of, they, they fit into these categories. They are atheists or agnostics, moral relativists, all kinds of things. And this is definitely a battle <laughs> that I've been having with some of them. Obviously not uh, because I want to argue with them, but because I love them and I don't want them to believe nonsense, right? So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be sharing a little bit from personal experience some of the things that have happened in those conversations. Probably not too much. I'm not going to get too much into detail of that just out of respect for them and, and because honestly that's my personal experience and it's not going to be the same for everybody. But I do think that there's something that everybody can learn from one another and so hopefully the details that I do share you guys find helpful. All right, but regardless, you know, as, as always, I want to um, base whatever I say on scripture. And so that's really where I'm going to be working out of. I don't want to work out of just personal experiences. Those can be helpful, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't, I don't want it to just be off of that, right? So how then do we address this issue? Obviously, uh, in the Western world, right, in Europe, in the United States and other parts that are being more and more westernized, um, this is this is kind of a big deal. You know, it, it's, it's becoming more and more of an issue. And so we need to know how to address it. And I'll, I'll just be upfront with you guys from the get-go. The answer is not all that complicated. It's complicated in how we might apply it and in coming together to agree on how to apply it. But the answer itself is not all that complicated, and I think you guys will see why. So, what can we do about atheism? What can we do about moral relativism? What can we do about all these things? Well, it really comes down to three <laughs> simple steps. Not easy, but simple. Share the gospel with, uh, you know, as much as you can, as often as you can, with everyone that you can. All right, remember Mark 16, 15, spread the gospel or share the gospel with all, all of creation. So that's really, really important. All of creation, everyone that you meet, everyone that you get a chance to, as often as you can. Okay, pretty simple. Number two, know how to defend the gospel with confidence, but also with gentleness and respect. That's a little bit easier said than done because there's a balance we are human beings, we are, we're fallible, and so sometimes we might get offended at what some people say. So we're going to get into that a little bit later, but essentially, you know, I get that principle from 1 Peter uh, uh, 3.15, right? Which hopefully you guys know it. Uh, always be ready to give a defense for the hope that is in you, but always do it with gentleness and respect. Um, <clears throat> and, and, you know, one of the things that I would say about that is know your opponent don't don't consider them an opponent like like an enemy, right? You want them to come to the truth. You don't you don't hate them, <laughs> or at least you shouldn't hate them. Uh, it can get frustrating to defend the gospel with people making strawman arguments and ad hominems and all that kind of thing. But remember that ultimately you're doing it for the sake of love, and because you care about them. Okay. So number one, share the gospel uh, with everyone as often as you can, as much as you can. Number two. Defend, know how to defend the gospel with confidence, but also with gentleness and respect. And number three, make disciples and teach them to follow Christ's um, commandments and teachings. Uh, 
Uh, and that that's something you have to do, whether by encouraging people to go to church and things like that. So I don't want to get too deep into it because I want to focus on each one individually first. So share the gospel as much as you can, as often as you can uh, with everyone that you can. So what does that look like? Well, you know, again, I, I say that that I would share some personal experiences to some extent. Um, obviously, it starts with family and friends, that kind of thing. So whoever you can share it with, uh, in terms of your closest people, definitely you want to bring that up. And that's that's the scary part for a lot of people because a lot of people say, well, you know, I have this relationship with so-and-so and if I bring up that I'm a Christian or if I try to push my Christianity on them too much... They might not like me, um, and I am. I understand that fear. It's a human fear, but it comes from the flesh. I'll be honest with you. It comes from the flesh because at that moment, what you're doing is you're prioritizing your relationship with someone, getting along with that person more than you're prioritizing their salvation. See, that's that's the problem that we often have is that we, we don't think about what this means for that person. We don't think about how we actually are not actually being very loving towards that person. If you love somebody, then you shouldn't really care if your relationship with them is going to be affected because you shared the gospel with them. Rather, you should have a conviction of saying, you know what, whether this person likes me or not, whether this person wants to talk to me or not, one of the things, oh, that's weird. I'm getting a reminder of something. Sorry about that. Um, whether this person wants to talk to me or not, or ever, or, or, or ends up hating me or not, is not my priority here. My priority is their salvation because I care about them. I love them. And I know that that's easier said than done, but you have to change your mind in, or, or, or your perspective, I should say, on that. And I would say pray about it. You know, pray about these fears that you have concerning sharing the gospel with somebody and possibly risking losing a relationship that you value. Of course, I'm not saying that it's not going to hurt to some extent if that does happen, but be aware that that might happen. But by the grace of God, even if you share the gospel with a person now and they absolutely refuse to listen to you, they refuse to consider anything that you're saying, who knows? Maybe in a couple of years, maybe something changes. Um, maybe in a few months, maybe in a day, you know, maybe they ask you more questions. That's the thing. We also get, we, we start anticipating what people are going to think. And we don't realize that, um, people don't necessarily always hate the gospel. <laughs> I mean, they do, right? We are expected or, or we should be expecting to be rejected, right? A lot of people, the, the natural man, right, does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. They are folly to him, to him excuse me. So, so yes, they are going to hate what you're telling them sometimes. But that doesn't mean that that's going to happen every single time with everybody else. Excuse me one second. This is, there's something here on the camera. What's going on? There we go. Sorry. That was bothering me. Maybe you guys didn't see it, but it was bothering me. So, <laughs> anyway. Um, so, uh, where was it? Yeah, so, so, so some people... They're not gonna. They're not gonna love everything that you have to say to them. But you'd be surprised how many people are actually willing to talk to you about the gospel if you take that chance. But you have to take it. So that that primarily has to do with our friends and our family. What about preaching to strangers? Listen, in my opinion, preaching to strangers should probably be easier because <laughs> worst case scenario, if they curse at you and you know do all kinds of evil things at you, at the end of the day, you can go home and you might not see that person ever again. So that's a win-win in, in my opinion. You know, if, if you get them to believe the gospel, great. If they don't believe it, well, you may not have to see them again. But make the effort, you know what I mean? Um, and I'm not saying that you have to go and, and every single day go preach the gospel on the street corner or anything like that. I mean, that'd be great. But that's not necessarily what everybody everybody is called to do. But, but say, for example... You know, um, I'll give you a very, very normal example, very standard example that happens to me a lot. Uh, whenever I go pick up like takeout or something, right, for, for me and my wife, sometimes we like to eat, um, um, you know, restaurant food because we don't want to cook <laughs> because we're tired. But 
yeah, you know, yeah, when, when we do that, uh, one of the things that I'll do is when I go get the food, maybe as I'm making the line to, to get the food, I'll start a conversation with a stranger. I'll be like, oh, you know, like, where are you from? Whatever. Like, you know, I might, I might notice a shirt that I like or something that they're doing or something they're talking about. You know, don't be afraid to put yourself out there. People like when, when you're friendly to them. They don't always like when you eventually sneak in there with the gospel <laughs> and the fact that you're a Christian. But, you know, um, that's that's definitely one, one thing that you can do is just try to strike up conversations with strangers. Another thing that you can do, uh, for example, the same thing. When I'm picking up food, I'll live a... Uh, live. I'll leave a tip. <laughs> and one of the things that I'll do is I'll leave a gospel tract as well. So, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to vocal. I mean, I would, I would encourage you not to simply hand out tracts and not have any kind of conversation with people at all. But, you know, sometimes I get it. Like if you're getting your feet wet kind of thing, then listen, just leave a gospel tract with somebody. Somebody might come to you and say, hey, uh, you, you gave me this, you know, what is this? And that might open up the opportunity for you to talk to them about it. So put yourself out there, you know, whether it's friends, families, or strangers, and, you know, do your service to God. Do your, your duty as somebody who is told to love their enemies, to pray for them by sharing the gospel with them in the hopes that they might convert. And I'm not saying that everybody's your enemy, but you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> like uh, whether it's friends, family, strangers, enemies, whatever the point is that you're called to love even your enemies. And so share the gospel with people that you don't even like, you know, um, because ultimately our mentality should be about bringing people to be part of our family. That, that's, that should be the Christian mentality. I have this family of God that I belong to and I want more people to join because um, it's nothing like I've ever had. And so I want to share this with everybody I can, I, I can right? It, the problem is that we often get so, I don't know what the right word would be, but maybe desensitized to the reality of this world being lost. And we kind of just become like, well, I'm good. My family's good, right? Like at least some of my family's good. Um, I'm just going to worry about, I'm just going to worry about me and my salvation and I'm good to go. And we don't really think about the ramifications of what it means to leave somebody without the gospel. I mean, they might not hear from anybody else ever again. And this is their only opportunity to hear it. And you could have, you could have shared it with them. You know what I mean? So be aware of that and take take compassion on people, right? Like atheists, agnostic people, you know, moral relativists, take compassion on them. Don't, they will try to, to sometimes, they, sometimes they can be quite upsetting <laughs> because of the nonsense that they say and the um, ridicule that they do towards uh, Christianity. But look at them as what they are. They're lost people who need the truth. And don't, you know, pray for them. Pray for them if, if you, if, if they won't listen, to just pray for them. All right, so that's number one. Share the gospel as much as you can, as often as you can. Number two, know how to defend the gospel with confidence, but also with gentleness and respect, right? First Peter 3.15. So know your opponent. And again, I'm not saying that they're actually your opponent. You're trying to gain a brother. But for the sake of argument, we'll just call them opponents. So know them and know their objections. Know what they're going to say. What do most people say, right? Truth is relative. That one's a new one, right? <laughs> there are many truths. Kind of the same thing. You can't prove there is a God. If God is so good, why is there so much suffering or, or pain in this world? Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. This <laughs> It's not fair that God would punish people for not believing in him. That one always makes me laugh on the inside. Don't laugh on the outside. They're not going to take kindly to it. Um, I'm speaking from personal experience. So don't, don't laugh. But if you want to laugh on the inside a little bit, that's okay. Truth is relative. Let's talk about that one. So how do we answer truth is relative? Or there are many truths. Or you live your truth, I live mine, and everything's going to be fine. 
right? Like all kinds of things related to moral relativism and moral or yeah, uh, relative truth. All that, all that nonsense. It's nonsense. You know why? Why it's nonsense? Because of one simple question. And I, I think I've talked about this before in some of my other videos. But it's nonsense. Because the fact that you say that means that you're making that truth claim. So if everything is subjective, right? If truth is subjective, as you claim it to be, then why are you saying something about truth that is objective? You're saying... Truth is subjective, and that's the truth. That's silly. <laughs> and I say that, you know, um, respectfully, but, but it's just silly. It's so dumb. I'm sorry, but it is. Like, don't you realize? I mean, they, they don't. They don't, because seeking to be wise, they became fools. People think that they're being so wise and enlightened when they say these things. And they think they're being so smart. They're not. They're not. It's one of the dumbest things you could say. Again, with all due respect, if somebody's watching this that is not a Christian, I'm not saying it to to be disrespectful, You're, but, but it's a dumb thing to say. Now, I'm not saying that I don't say dumb things sometimes, but you really haven't thought this through. The fact that you're making an objective truth claim in saying that truth is subjective is self-refuting. You're, you're, you're self-refuting your own argument. So, don't use that argument. Like, it's so dumb. Again, I apologize. I sh I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but it's true. It's true. <laughs> and I can say that because I believe that truth is objective. So, sorry. <laughs> but, but you know, it's, it's silly. It really is. Like, to say that truth is relative is just a self-refuting argument that should not be even entertained. Be ready for that one because a lot of people nowadays are using that one more than ever. You live my truth. I'll live my truth. You live your truth. Okay, so um, are we both right? Yes. How can that be? Explain it to me, right? Sometimes asking questions is a good way to just address these things, you know? You can't prove there is a God. Let's talk about that one. You can't prove there is a God. Okay. Where did we come from? Now, listen, that question doesn't prove God. But it starts the conversation of, like, let's find out. Let, let's see what the evidence is, right? So... Don't, don't think that just because you say, where do we come from, that that's a gotcha moment with, with that person. First of all, you're not trying to get them. You're trying to bring them to slowly see their inconsistencies and understand that there's more to this than what they've thought about, right? Like they, they haven't thought this through honestly or sincerely, or maybe they've been uh, fooled into thinking a certain way and they've just kind of gone with it, you know, whatever it might be. But you start with, where do we come from? And some people will say, you know, the Big Bang or, you know, whatever it might be. This is what it comes down to, though. This is what it comes down to. And it's very simple because the Bible tells us Romans, Romans 1 through 3, Romans 1 through 3 tells us why it is that human beings do this. And it's because no one seeks after God. Nobody, everybody wants to deny, everybody suppresses the truth. Everybody wants to deny the existence of God because then they know that they are guilty. And I admit that that was me at one point. I was, I was an atheist in high school. And so I had that kind of worldview. Um, but, but deep down, I think I knew. I just, I just didn't want to believe it. Or maybe I was like, well, these Christians, they're so self-righteous and they think they know everything. We can't know, right? That, that, I will say this. I respect, I respect an agnostic in that sense, right? In saying, I don't know. Maybe there is a God. Maybe there isn't God. Like, there's a bit more humility there. Um, but at the same time, though, I kind of don't respect them because it's like, well, you're not even taking a position. <laughs> so, which tells me you haven't really thought about this, nor do you care to think about it, which, I don't know. There, there's pros and cons. Anyway, I'm getting off track. The point is that you can't prove there is a God. Well, okay. I'm not going to necessarily in attempt at first to prove the Christian God. But I will prove that there is a creator because we have natural revelation and we have special revelation. Special revelation is what we find in scripture. Natural revelation is what we find in nature. Okay? 
nature itself shows us that there is a God, that there is a creator. Because if you look at a building, you know there's a builder. Like, you're not dumb. You see there's design in it. If you look at um, a car, nobody, nobody in the right mind would ever say a car just came out of nowhere. Even if you believe in evolution, right? And I'm talking about uh, macroevolution, not, not microevolution, because we, we, I don't deny microevolution. Am I saying it right? Like, like microevolution is small changes within the same species over time, right? So if that's microevolution, which I think it is. Yes, yes, it is. It is. I'm sorry. I'm just blanking out. Um, I do believe that there are small changes within the same species over time. For example, I'm really tall. My parents are not that tall. You know, like it happens. We, we change, we mute the, you know, our genes mutate. And so things happen. Um, although I have other tall people being, you know, anyway, <laughs> I'm getting off track. The point is this, you can see that there is design in life. You can see that there is design in this world. You can look at the law of gravity and the laws of physics and all these other laws and these constants and show that there is order, that there's control. That doesn't happen without an intelligent mind behind it. You're telling me that a tree that has everything that it needs to survive, and if anything slightly changes, that tree will die. If, 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 if it doesn't have the precise precise exact design that it has just one thing could be slightly off and that's it that tree will not live it's self-evident you cannot refute it you cannot refute it i'm not talking about a specific god but you cannot refute this has design in fact scientists often describe animals and and plants and things like that with the word design because it is so obvious that it just comes out. You don't know what other word to use because they are designed. So that's nonsense. Okay. Once again, that's nonsense. And, you know, we can get into that all night, but I'm not trying to make this video longer than I should. Um, <laughs> it's just frustrating, guys. It's frustrating. And I'm sure you guys probably feel it too whenever you have these kinds of conversations. Anyway, so, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to address every single one, but like, since we're at it, if God is so good, why is there so much suffering in the world? Okay, well, let's take the presumption, right? Like that this person is maybe saying, okay, maybe the Christian God is true for whatever reason, you've led them to that point. But even if, if the Christian God is true, if, if he's real, I have a question, which is if he is so good, why is there so much suffering in the world? Well, here's the funny thing that I find about atheists and agnostic and other people that... Um, that deny God or resist the truth of God. They won't like it. No, they will like God no matter what conditions we're under. So what I mean by that is this. If God kept all suffering from happening, then what would they say? They would say, oh, well, we're just robots. We can't do whatever we want to do. We can't sin the way we want to do it. Because here's the problem. Sin is the cause of suffering. It is. War is, is, comes from greed. I mean, there's, there's people who go to war not because they want to, but because they're defending themselves. But, but at least one party is greedy. <laughs> at least one party is greedy in war. Right? Or, or self-absorbed or whatever you want to call it. Uh, they want something. Right? They want to control other people. That's sinful. And they're willing to kill over it. That's sinful. So, stealing, right? I want, I, I want what my neighbor has. Coveting, right? No matter where you go, it's always because of sin. And so, these people say, well, you know, it, it, God, God allows suffering, so he's mean. Right? He's horrible, so I don't want to worship that God. Okay, well, do you know what the alternative is? <laughs> See, God gave Adam and Eve free will. And you saw what happened. So, we don't have anyone to blame but ourselves. Because we're the ones that choose to do the things that create problems in the first place. 
And it's been like that since the beginning. But there's no there's no satisfying these people, right? If God does it one way, they're going to be mad. If he does it another way, they're going to be mad. So in reality, the problem isn't that they're suffering in the world and you have a problem with God being all powerful and good and being able to stop it. The problem is that you just hate him. It's the truth. You may not want to accept it, but it's the truth. That's really what it comes down to, guys. No matter what God does, they're going to have a problem with it. And, you know, again, there's more to say about that, but I'm not trying to make a long video. Although I'm already over 20 minutes and I apologize. Can't help myself. <laughs> so we're probably going to do this like a uh, 40-minute video. Hopefully less than that, but I can't promise anything. You know, I'm just winging it every time I do one of these videos. All right. It's not fair that God would punish people for not believing in him. Well, okay. So let me tell you something. That That is a misunderstanding of why God punishes people. And it kind of really relates to that earlier point that I just made about God being so good, you know, and why, why they're suffering in the world. So, and here's why I know that they don't care about whether God stops suffering or not. Because God then says, okay, listen, I'm going to punish the people that cause this suffering in the world. And then people say, well, those people didn't believe in you. Why would you punish them? This is your fault. It's, it's always the same thing. They just want to blame God, right? God doesn't punish people for not believing in him. God punishes people for doing bad things. <laughs> like, this is not that complicated. And and maybe, you know, because I'm a Christian, I can I can kind of, you know, I've gone through this so many times that I can rationalize it. But again, I, I would be probably more patient with somebody who has never really thought these things through or or even if they have i mean you know we're supposed to be patient with people and and it's it's not easy but with the help of the holy spirit i do believe that when we when we truly want to bring honor to god and we keep that in our minds and that comes into our heart the holy spirit will guide us and and we will be patient you know i don't think i don't think i've ever lost my cool thank god uh while sharing the gospel with somebody that's very very um combative and so I will tell you that that's definitely not me because I don't like it when people are combative. I get defensive really, really fast. But when it comes to sharing the gospel, I actually can can be pretty patient with people. Not not to brag. I'm not trying to, you know, I'm telling you, like, it's it's really not me. It's, it's the guidance of that Holy Spirit. And so I appreciate that God helps us through that. And so he can help you guys as well, you know, whenever you're sharing the gospel. But you have to know why it is that you believe what you believe and you have to know how to defend them that's my whole point with this right so keep in mind first peter three fifteen. go read it read it after this if you don't uh, if, you, if you have some time um, because it's really really important that we understand we have to be confident in what we believe we have to know what we believe but we have to defend it with gentleness and respect knowing that we're trying to win a brother not push somebody further out okay all right, so we talked about sharing the gospel as often as possible with everybody as possible, as many people as possible, excuse me. Uh, we talked about how to defend the gospel with confidence, but with gentleness and respect. So now we get to the third point. Make disciples and teach them to follow Christ's commandments and teachings. Remember, what are we talking about here? We're talking about what can we do about widespread uh, atheism and moral relativism. So one of the ways that we do that is by making more Christians, <laughs> making more disciples, right? As the truth of the gospel goes out and we share that truth with other people, uh, maybe we connect with them, we exchange phone numbers, we encourage them to uh, uh, go to a biblical church. Now, listen, a lot of Christians, a lot of new Christians might hear the gospel and convert. It's really important that you guys try to help people find biblical churches and what i mean by that is not necessarily a church that would agree with your particular theology 100 percent, but at least a church that you know will have the solid gospel and i mean it's it's great right like for example i'm reformed if i can get people into reformed churches that's amazing you know i'm i'm, I'm pushing for people to attend presbyterian churches all the time because i know there's not that many reformed baptist churches out there Although, of course, if I can get them into a Reformed Baptist, I will. But the point is that the differences between Presbyterianism and Reformed Baptists is not that much. 
And so if I want somebody to get the essentials and the important things, I'm going to send them to a Presbyterian church if that's where, um, is if that's the, the the easiest thing to get them into. If I can't uh, do that, then maybe I'll consider like a Calvinistic Baptist church that's not necessarily Reformed, but Calvinistic. Um, that's just my personal take. You guys might disagree, and that's okay. I'm not I'm not here to talk about doctrine, but we have to at least agree with a church that stands for the deity of Christ, right? The essential of the gospel, that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, all for the glory of God alone, according to scripture alone. We have to at least find churches that, that stand for these truths, right? The essential truths. Everything else, God will take care of. But we have to help people find churches whenever possible. Now, I'm not saying you're going to be able to do that with everybody. Um, but if you can't, Stay in touch with them, right? And keep keep studying with them whenever you can. Ask them how they're doing. Start a Bible study. Maybe you can start a Bible study with some people that are newer Christians and you can help them out. There's different ways to go about it or maybe get them connected with somebody that you know. Again, just don't leave them to find their own church 100%. And that that's part of the problem. I think we're, we're pretty good. I'm not going to say we're really good as Christians. We're pretty good at sharing the gospel we're not very good at making disciples and we need to fix that. That that part is really, really important because a lot of people can be uh, tossed around by every wind of doctrine. That's not a good thing. They can be misled. There's a lot of false teaching out there and new Christians don't know anything. I mean, they don't know right from wrong. Like when I was a new Christian, listen, things are only worse now. And when I was a new Christian, things were very confusing. And by the grace of God, I, I am where I am now. But it can, it can be quite dangerous. So I, I really do think that we need to make every effort to stay connected with people. Don't just share the gospel with them, but stay connected with them. Help them find a biblical church. Listen, nowadays, the internet makes everything so easy. If you can find a, a church, look at their statement of faith or, or what um, confession they hold to or whatever it might be. It's usually on the website. And the churches that don't put what they believe, I'm talking about non-denominational churches, stay away from those. I'm sorry, but stay away from those. Nine times out of 10, they are not solid theologically. They're not. They're not because I, I hate the saying, no religion, just a relationship. I used to hold to it because I was an idiot <laughs> at one point in my Christian life. Um, but all these people that say, we don't need theology, we just need Jesus, right? Like, you will find a lot of those in non-denominational churches. And I'm not saying every non-denominational is bad. Don't get me wrong. Please don't take that the wrong way. But I'm talking about, like, the non-denominational, like, you know, big Stephen Furtick type church uh, where it's just all about show instead of preaching the word of God or personal stories from the pastor, that kind of thing. They won't put statements of faith or they'll put very very brief statements of faith and they usually step and doo-doo <laughs> when they do because you read that statement of faith and you're like mm, this is not biblical but find churches that actually have good solid statements of faith that that hold to a confession that kind of thing those are the churches that you want to go with and keep tabs on this person invite them to your church that would even be better if you can um if you trust your church, if your church is a good one. If your church is not a good one, don't send them to your church. <laughs> but hopefully, you know, I'm under the presumption that most of you guys go to good biblical churches. So, um, yeah, you know, that that's, that's probably something that we need to, as Christians, work on. Not just preaching the gospel, but keeping tabs on people, making them disciples, you know, guiding them, staying in touch with them, that kind of thing. All right, so... Those are the three main points on how do we change this world. So a couple of things that I that I want to also make a note of, all right? This starts in the home, okay? So yes, we preach the gospel to everyone. We defend it. We make disciples. All of that is good. But all of this has to start in the home. So if you're married, if you're married and you have children, first of all, if you don't have children, have children, okay? There's another video that I made on why why uh, Christians should have children. It was more specific on how many children uh, Christians should have. Should they set a limit? Look it up if you're interested. But definitely have children. Christians should not not have children if they are able to. Okay? 
So have children. It starts in the home. Train them up. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is older, he will not de depart from it. So preach the gospel to your children. Um, defend it. Show them, show them how to defend it. Right. Teach them how to have these conversations because eventually they're going to go out into the world and they need to know how to stand for what they believe in. And um, make them disciples. Family worship. Have family worship every day. Read scripture. Sing songs. Worship God. Pray. Do all these things every single day. Like, like going to the gym. Train them. Train them. And don't prioritize over things, or, or other things, excuse me, before this. Okay? Don't prior, prioritize TV. Don't prioritize video games. Don't prioritize going out as a family. All of that is fine. I'm not saying don't do those things. I'm just saying this has to come first. Training them up in the way that they should go. Teaching them the ways of the Lord. All right? Uh, number two. Whether it's with our children or whether it's with our friends or family or strangers or whatever, we must be patient. Okay? We're trying to change the world. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to address the issue of atheism, moral relativism, and it's not going to happen in one day or one month or one year. It's going to happen one person at a time, one soul at a time. And so we need to understand that we can't say, okay, I'm going to save a hundred people today. Not that we say, but you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm going to preach the gospel to a hundred people today. And I hope that all a hundred of them like come to, to Christ, right? No, that's not the way it works. Pray to God that you might be able to save one person per day. And if God is willing, maybe he'll give you that, but that's not always going to happen. So be patient. Listen, remember mustard seed. The kingdom is like a mustard seed. It's small starts out small, little by little by little it's growing, but we have to be patient. We may not see the fruits of our labor in our lifetime, and we need to understand that. We may not see the fruits of our labor in our lifetime. My grandfather was a Christian. My grandfather talked to me about the gospel all the time. I never wanted to hear it. I never wanted to, to sit there and listen to him. I wanted to go play with the other kids. But later on in life, I remembered what my grandfather used to tell me. And especially now, and he passed away. So he never got to see the fullness of what, what it meant to preach the gospel to me. But he made an impact. So understand that not everything that you do is necessarily going to bear fruit right now. So be patient. Trust in God. Walk in his ways, trusting that the Holy Spirit will convict hearts at the right time. Okay? Okay. Another point, we must not compromise with the world. I am so sick and tired of Christians compromising with the world. I am so tired of that. Like, why do we do this? Why do we compromise with the world? Why is it that, you know, part of the reason why we are where we are here in the United States, at least, with the whole, you know, LGBT and, and you know, communists <laughs> running the country pretty much, all of that is because of constant, constant compromise. I'm so tired of it. It's because we're afraid and we don't know how to defend our position. So whether it's politics, whether it's in the home, whether it's in social justice, whatever it might be, stand for the truth of God. Don't let people push you around. Be confident in what you believe in. And, and, and push for truth, right? A lot of Christians that are younger, especially, for example, they're afraid of saying that they don't believe that gay marriage is, is good. But why not? Because they care more about what the world thinks of them. Or they're, they're, they're afraid of, of calling abortion sin. Because they're afraid of what... I'm not saying everybody, don't get me wrong, but a lot of them. Uh, they're just afraid of what the world will, will say about them. And again, it, this goes back to like, I don't want to lose relationships and this and that. Listen, you're in the army of God now. This is not about you. This is about Him. And about saving souls for Christ. So if you're not thinking about it that way, you need to check yourself and you need to pray about it. All right. So don't compromise with the world. And lastly, and, and again, this is, I could go on forever, but, but this is one of the most important things I would say is we must pray. Pray that God uh, gives us greater convictions to do these things, that he gives us the strength to get these things done. Uh, 
We must pray for the lost souls that, that are out there that need to hear the gospel. We must pray for our nations and our leaders. We have to pray for them, even if we don't like them. And I admit that sometimes I don't want to pray for Joe Biden. <laughs> but we have to do it. it, it you know, he, At the end of the day, he is the leader of this country. And I shouldn't want him to fail, right? Like, why would I want... I mean, he's already doing that on his own. <laughs> but, but I shouldn't be... Um, desire you know like like enjoying the fact that he's failing no like first and foremost that affects me so like no <laughs> but but also you know like if we love others we should want them to succeed right and i want i want i i hope that he repents of his sin i hope that he turns to god i really do that'd be so much better to me right like like Imagine if Joe Biden came out and said, you know, if, if his mind is still okay. <laughs> not going to get into that right now. But <laughs> if his mind were, were okay. Um, imagine if he came out and said, you know, I, I've done some serious, serious wrong. I am repentant over my sin and, and, and I've actually accepted uh, Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That'd be so much better. That would be so much better than seeing him fail and seeing him lose the next election. Like a thousand times better. Not only would that mean that we're going to have a better leader, hopefully, um, and that he's going to start doing things right, but I've gained a brother in Christ. Even if I don't know him personally, I've gained a brother in Christ. Like, praise God for that. You know what I mean? So pray for your leaders. Pray for your country. Uh, or other countries too. Pray for this world. And finally, the last thing I'll say is study the word. Study the Bible. Know your Bible. Know your verses. Know, but 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 listen. Don't just don't just read it and memorize it. Understand it, right? Use commentaries. Understand why it is that we're being told what we're being told. Why does it matter? Because God has spoken through His word, and there's something to be said about how we understand the world if we understand the Bible. If we understand the Bible, we'll understand the condition of man, what man needs, how we can help them. But if we don't study the Bible, then we're just learning a bunch of stories but not really knowing how to apply them. So, uh, I know I went way over, so I apologize. But, hey, whatever, it's my channel. <laughs> I'll try to keep the videos short, guys. Uh, guys um, I will try to keep my videos short, but... I can't promise that I'll always do it. So anyway, thank you guys so much for watching this video. As always, if this was helpful to you, subscribe. Let me know in the comments what you think. And if you have any questions at all, send me an email. Reform.recon.channel at gmail.com. Again, reform.recon.channel at gmail.com. Thank you guys again for watching. God bless. Take care.